thank you. Uh, so I have uh, way too many slides, but we're just going to do it. It's going to be great. Um, so just quickly about me. These are kind of my credentials for why I should even be talking about that. I think the most important credential is the photo of me with a really full neck beard. Because if you're going to be doing cloud infrastructure, neck beards, they count for a lot. Uh, Fog Modeler is my, my Twitter handle. And I'm going to be releasing more information on Twitter in the coming months. We're going to have some releases and whatnot. Uh, I work for a company called Near Space Labs. We're a high altitude, high frequency imaging company. And uh, yeah, we've just completed our, our first really large survey in Austin, Texas. We're hiring, if anyone is interested in software engineering or, or data analysis. Uh, so yeah, now onto the talk. But, it, but first, I'd like to talk about my, my beef with the GeoJSON. Um, but actually, my beef with GeoJSON doesn't matter because it's, you know, it's, it's part of the GIS world. I'd also like to point out it's really amazing that on the internet you can get a, a stock photo of a meat tenderizer holding an Erlenmeyer flask while wearing glasses and smiling. I didn't, I didn't know that I needed that. Uh, so what is Stack? I don't know if a lot of you have been in some of the other Stack uh, talks. But uh, this is a, a joint effort between a lot of different groups to create a standard for, for sharing spatiotemporal asset catalogs. So basically, what I think of it is, is like, you know, if you work for Planet and you work for Maxar and for Near Space Labs, each one of us making our own API for accessing data, our own client libraries, it just doesn't make any sense, like this kind of reproduction of work. And it's also a pain in the ass for all the customers, because then they have to go through and use these different client libraries. So if there's one client library for everyone to search different imagery data sets, it's just going to make everyone a lot happier. Um, but so Stack is. It's implemented with JSON and OpenAPI and some, some linting on the JSON so that your kind of your definition for your service is ensured to be up to the specification that the, the group has put forward. Uh, a different version would be using protobuf and, and gRPC. So first, like what is what is protobuf? So this is the the lingua franca of, of Google since 2003. It's a, a binary message format. You can kind of think of it as like a, a more compact XML or, or JSON. It's, it's strongly typed. I don't know if you've ever heard this story of this like 10 years ago, Steve Yegi. I can't, I don't know what his name is, but he wrote this internal blog post at Google criticizing Google saying, we're not doing a good job of consuming our own APIs. He was saying, like, AWS is doing this terrific job of forcing everyone that works at AWS to be consuming the APIs. And I think part of the reason that Google couldn't do that was because all of their services use protobufs. They don't use JSON. They don't use XML. And it was just they, they figured it was a, a difficult ramp up for people to learn how to use this. Uh, another thing about this uh, protobufs is that it's, it's a nice way to actually evolve your message format. So instead of using JSON or XML, you've got this protobuf. And as you extend it, uh, old APIs that were using a previous version of this message, say this person message that's defined here, would still continue to function even though you're adding new uh, key value pairs onto the, the format definition. And you can even do things like change the names. So you see here, uh, there's string email. You could, uh, you could change string to Correo Electronico, and then it would still work. It's just this number that's to the right that actually defines uh, the position of that data and where it's stored in the protobuf message. Uh, so what is gRPC? So gRPC is something you can think of as like, this is a framework similar to, to a combination of OpenAPI and REST. 
Uh, it's been open sourced by, by Google in 2016. It's now part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so it's, it is supported. It is uh, also something that you can actually yeah, it's, it's well supported. You can, you can rely on this, and it is still in, in active development. Uh, so why, why even look into using gRPC and protobufs? Uh, yeah, so the serialization of protobufs is, yeah, it, it makes the protobufs, the messages themselves, smaller than JSON. So when you care about you know, network-bound processes, you want to put less information out onto the network. And so smaller messages means that you're going to be taking up less bandwidth. Uh, part of the other performance credentials is like protobuf and gRPC is what Google uses internally for all of its services. And so when you can say that they're using 10 billion you know, of these RPC requests per second, you can think like, all right, this is, this is pretty well tested. Um, so, like, why, why we chose it internally, like, the streaming is really easy. You can have bi-directional streaming. You can have, like, server-side streaming. And it also allows us to quickly generate client libraries in multiple languages. So if somebody wants to access our data using C++ or Go or Java, like, we already have a client library that we can compile for them just using the, the proto-definition file, which is this, this uh, message on the right-hand side, I'm able to use something called a proto-compiler in order to create the serialization and deserialization code for these messages. And using those proto-files, I can also define my, my services. Uh, so these are a few graphs that uh, Uber put together when they were looking for a new message format because JSON messages were getting to be a little bit too large. Uh, you can't really read this, but you can see the bars and, and green things are, are what's uh, our JSON messages and the red are the protobuf messages. And so what this is is the total encoding and decoding time. And you can see that Protobuf does pretty well. Something called Thrift is, is actually what they found to be the fastest. Thrift was a few engineers from Google leaving, going to Facebook and saying like, hey, we should have our own RPC framework and, and message format. Uh, you can also see that the message size of, of Protobuf, it's significantly smaller than the, the JSON messages. It's interesting if you look, uh, this is, you know, and, and this is particular to, to Uber's data. It can, be, it can be different for every type of message format. But all the way down at the bottom here, uh, Pickle is actually larger than JSON. So at, <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know what the format of their data was, that pickling it with Python would make it worse than uh, that it actually would be in JSON, but. Just something to note. So this, this pink line on the lower left-hand corner is sort of where Uber said, like, all right, these are the, the best performing message formats for, for both encoding and uh, size. But Uber didn't end up using protobuf because it's really strict. Uh, so you, know, you have this proto file definition, and it has all of these fields in it. And it's not something as dynamic as JSON is. Like with JSON, we can just kind of create this map and stuff whatever we want in it. It does sort of require, though, that the person sending the message and the person receiving the message both know what they're looking for. Not always, though. You can just kind of search through a message and, and look for things. So actually, this, this strictness of protobuf is to our advantage when we're defining a standard for how we want to transmit data. Because right now, what we do with uh, what they've, they've done with the Stack Project, it's, it's really impressive. They've, they've also created a linter in order to make sure that whenever people define their Stack service, it is in accordance with what the definition of, of Stack means. With these proto files, we can just have a proto file, and and yeah, you don't have to have a linter. It's it's very it's strict. Uh, so these are some of I told you how there's this proto compiler which actually creates both the
the, the client libraries for serialization and deserialization, and also the client stub for communicating with the gRPC service. Uh, so these are all the languages that are supported by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, but there are other languages that are supported by the community. Uh, I know it isn't really a language, but it's, it's on there. Uh, um, so, and who's using gRPC? A lot of the people that are using gRPC are pretty big companies. And so, yeah, I think that some people are afraid of adopting a new framework. What I've found personally was it's easier for me to get up and running with a gRPC client and server. Just, it, it, it was easier for me than using OpenAPI. Uh, the proto definition was clear for me to understand. The documentation that on gRPC IO was really good. So, but I think the reason that you're seeing a lot of these bigger companies move internally towards using these RPC frameworks is that they're getting to a point where their budget, they care about the amount of, of network bandwidth that they're consuming, that, that it actually yeah, someone can say, like, we can save a considerable amount of money by making our messages smaller. Uh, yeah. So one of the other things that I didn't mention about gRPC, but I should, is that it, it uses HTTP2 natively. I think more of us are getting familiar with the idea that HTTP2 is, is the way forward. Uh, so, like, if you're, like, say you're compiling GDAL yourself now, you actually want to compile curl with this ng HTTP2 library because that will improve all of your kind of your cloud optimized geotiff pulling and all of that stuff. So, gRPC is built on that like natively. You, you actually can't use HTTP 1.1, which there's some load balancing issues with that, but we can talk about that in questions. So, our current stack service, so recently we wanted to kind of make some, some stack data sets available. Personally, as a company, we're using NAEP because we're actually using NAEP for part of our, our pipeline. Uh, that's hosted on AWS. And then there's also a Landsat on AWS that a lot of people are using. And we haven't seen so many people uh, do a stack service with Landsat on, on Google Cloud, and we thought, oh, that'd be cool. Uh, so we've also, on our, our stack service, we're, we're serving the Google Cloud data, which, in a way, it's kind of cool that they've got Landsat data from 1972 to the present. Uh, so, and in all of these cases, you're able to search by, you know, spatial extent, temporal extent, by, like, the ground sampling distance or cloud cover. And, yeah, what other people have talked about, Matt talked about earlier, it's really cool that I can say, like, I want to, you know, get something like cloud cover, make a request, and get back results from multiple data sets according to that. Like, I'm not just restricted to searching for cloud cover on Landsat. Like, that same variable works on the data that we provide or the data that NAEP provides. Of course, NAEP is actually cloud free. So, uh, so Postgres. So, we're using Postgres. This is just. <laughs> I'm more sharing this because I'm not terribly experienced with Postgres, and I'm trying to figure out like what is the right thing to do. So right now, what we have is like we have a stack table where we say, all right, we have geometry in there, we have the time component, and then all other tables refer uh, to this stack ID as a as a foreign key. So you can see down below there's this electro optical table and that's the one that has all of these details where if it's electro optical data and it has something like cloud cover or azimuth then you can search that data uh, according to those parameters. Uh, in order to get the Landsat data in we actually Google Cloud makes a they have a I think it's a big query table so we just Actually, there's a big query table and then there's a CSV. So we just took their CSV and used that to uh, put it into our, our PostGIS database. So we've also, we've created the NAEP ats assets. So the whole idea, like, again, like maybe some of you haven't heard about stack. Like this, there are these qualities of stack data that you want to search by. 
and this metadata is interesting to you, say like the cloud cover or this azimuth, but you also want to know what are the as assets associated. Like what are the lists of like geotiffs or other metadata that's stored in uh, cloud storage that you want to access. Uh, and these assets for us were built using the CSV and from these, these shape files from uh, Esri actually, I think organized those, those shape files. Um, so let's see, queries. Yeah, these are kind of the different levels of queries of what you can, you can query by. So at the stack level, geometry, processed uh, date, updated date, observed date. There are these, these, in typical stack right now, I think it's mostly just like there's a date time that you can query by. We felt like we wanted an observed time, a processed time, and then also an updated time, like when was the last time that the metadata was updated. Uh, we've also, we've open sourced uh, a Python client, which is just basically like a generic Python client for gRPC stack. So this Python client will not work with your, your JSON stack, but it will work with the service that, that we have up and running. So if you actually are, are interested in querying and, and playing around with gRPC, there's a lot of good documentation there, and uh, yeah, you should be able to check it out. Uh, so these are kind of some sample queries of, of what it looks like to use the, the generated protobuf code. So everything in here, this is, this is Python, everything in here that has kind of underscore PB2 at the top here in the, the from statements, that's generated code that was created by the, the proto compiler. Um, so yeah, we've got, this is a, like a bounding box query. We've got a query that is more like a, a time range query. And then some more complicated queries. And again, all of this is documented in, our, uh, in the repo that I shared earlier in the slides. And I guess I'll tweet out these slides. I don't know how, how this is getting shared at this conference. So upcoming work. So like I said before, like we've just recently collected a lot of data uh, and our data resolution, yeah, I mean, it's probably like 30 centimeter data. And yeah, we collected multiple surveys of Austin, Texas as sort of like our first run. So we'd like to make a lot of that publicly available so that people can start using that. So that's like, I've been working full time on like stack stuff and then also data processing. So I'm gonna step back from stack a little bit, although I'll, I'll continue to help with any kind of issues that come up with the repos. Um, there's a few other things in here, like I'm gonna write some, some medium articles, maybe on gRPC and protobuf. If people in the community are interested in learning about these tools and using them more, I'd, I'd love to share my experience. So if there's interest, please let me know. Uh, yeah, and, and we're gonna continue the process of getting our gRPC protobuf version of stack actually accepted as a part of the stack specification. Um, and I'd also like, I, yeah, I'd like to get Sentinel-2 in there. I'd like to get Nexrad data in. Uh, and I've, so I've written a service, a stack service in Go. And again, like if there's interest in this, I'd, I'd love for people to let me know because I would, I would you know, I've already got the okay to open source it, and, uh, but it takes effort to open source it, and if no one's gonna look at it, then <laughs> like, I, I would rather not. Uh, yeah, so I wonder if this will actually work. How does this work? It won't work if it goes to Chrome, I bet, which is sort of, oh no, it will. So this was from uh, a recent flight in Texas and, oh, you can't see it. What a bummer. I can see it. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not really sure how that works. Exit the presentation. All right. So. I guess I just close that. And then... Well, at any rate, we can maybe, maybe you can help me show it and then I can take questions. So if there are any questions, 
now's the time. I feel like I went really kind of like, there's a lot of content there. The proto buffs, the gRPC stack, uh, it's, it's a lot. So, <laughs> but I really, I feel like I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm working for Google. Like I want people to use proto buff and gRPC. But by the way, proto buff and gRPC, they're like part of the cloud native computing foundation. So you don't have to worry about it being in like a closed source solution anymore. Thanks for that. It was a really good talk. Um, I'm interested to know how you are consuming these gRPC services that you're publishing. So what are they used in? What apps, applications are they used in and how? What do they do? Uh, so internally, I'm using, like we're using gRPC and stack right now for just basically keeping track of all of our imagery metadata. Uh, we also have a, a gRPC geometry service that we're using because my, because the stack service is written in Go and there's not really like, like the one Go geometry library, we've got a, a geometry library written in Java that's a gRPC service. And then we also have a, our data processor is, is connecting to a lot of these different services. So we're using them a lot in house uh, and then I guess all of us, if you're using Google Cloud, you're using like gRPC in a way because even though, yeah, a lot of those client libraries are using gRPC under the hood. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it's just, uh, it's just pretty. I mean, I really like this, like being able to see something like this. And uh, yeah, but are there any, any other questions? I think I can just, oh, he has one. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so you, you brought up the issue of thrift, and I guess it uh, made me curious if you could compare and contrast uh, strengths and weaknesses of, of thrift for similar tasks. Uh, so I, I actually can't. I didn't, I think the, the documentation for gRPC and protobuf was good enough that I just went, all right, I'm doing this. Like, I'm not going to. I'm, I, I don't have enough time to actually do the, the kind of performance evaluation. But from what I've heard, it's, it's really great. And actually, as far as like a message encoding format, there's something called Cap'n Proto, which is like a play on, uh, I think, Captain Crunch the cereal. Uh, but so this, this gentleman who wrote this, this proto spec at Google left and has written the the binary format to beat all binary formats, but it's just not very well supported. But you can actually use thrift messages in gRPC if you would prefer to, which is also a, a cool thing. You could probably even use JSON if you wanted to subject yourself to that. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Great presentation and. Uh, well, you mentioned about JSON and they have a lint. I'm just thinking that they could have used the JSON schema, which basically can be used to make like a XML schema. So to be used like an XML schema for XML is the same thing for JSON schema. Uh, other than that, I, it's also worth mentioning that for a gRPC it's good because basically you can serialize and deserialize uh, entire let's say objects in it, and no matter, of course God doesn't have objects, but anyway. So uh, the thing is that uh, in JSON that it's kind of difficult because uh, you might have lots of problems with that because serializing and deserializing in JSON gives you faulty objects, let's like, say like that, because uh, it, they are not checked. And uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for a great presentation, David, and uh, 